Hi, today I'm going to look at analysing the performance of a Windows 2003 file server using Wireshark and Excel. We have quite a lot of material to cover and so I'm going to split the work over a number of videos and in this first one we're going to look at filtering the traffic in Wireshark and exporting it to a CSV. So the setup I had was the one you see in front of you. I have a Wash, uh, sorry, a Windows PC, um, and it's talking across the internet via VPN to a Windows 2003 file server. And I'm running Wireshark on the file server. And just out of interest, I'm also running Microsoft Process Monitor or Procmon on the PC. I'm going to just use it to um, show some, uh, demonstrate some of the information that you can see in the packets um, captured by Wireshark. So the scenario was this: that uh, the first thing I did was I opened a command box on the PC and I prepared a ping to be sent as a marker. Um, if you're an RPL practitioner, you'll be familiar with this uh, concept. But basically, it's just a ping uh, which I can easily identify. I just used ping space minus n1, which meant that I was just going to send one ping packet, and then minus l101, so I was going to send a ping packet of 101 bytes, which I can then subsequently find in my Wireshark trace. So once I had the ping marker all ready to go, I then opened Windows Explorer, I navigated to the folder on the file server where the uh, holding a particular PDF document. I then started Wireshark and Procmon and then I double clicked on the PDF and the PDF was called Network Trace Analysis Strategies White Paper dot PDF. Nice snappy little title. And then I waited for the document to render in Acrobat Reader. Acrobat Reader wasn't open initially, so this whole process involved starting up Acrobat Reader and then reading the file across the network and rendering it to the user. And as soon as I could see the document in the reader, I sent the ping. And then I stopped Procmon and I stopped Wireshark. So let's have a look at the actual trace. We'll look at the network trace first. One thing I did do, I didn't say, when I ran the Wireshark trace, I actually filtered on traffic to and from the test PC. I wouldn't normally advise this if you're in a, a live troubleshooting environment, but um, for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, it seemed like a good idea. So let's start off by checking that we've actually got the ping marker. So if I look for ICMP, and here I have a ping marker, and as you can clearly see, it's 101 bytes. So I'm pretty confident that that's the marker, and that marks the point where um, the document was rendered. If I look above that, what I see is read requests, so I'm reading data. But actually, there is something slightly strange here because. If I keep going down here, I'm still reading data even after my ping request. So this, I think, is because um, a PDF doesn't load in a sequential manner. It, it does this scatter load thing. Adobe's document that defines the structure of a PDF file says that uh, a reader should start reading at the end of the file, reads a, a trailer record, it then accesses a table of contents and it then loads blocks out of the main body of the file. So it doesn't read in a straightforward sequential manner. And I think what happened was the page was rendered, but it hadn't completed loading. Anyway, we can see that we actually have um, that ping marker. Now, the other thing I need to do is let's make sure that I actually have the right session and I'm looking at the right thing. What I'm going to do is look for the words network trace. I'll probably find them in the packet list. I'm more than likely to find them in the packet details, but I tend to prefer to actually look at the packet bytes. So let's do a find for that. And sure enough, here we have our 
some sort of operation, SMB operation, um, accessing the uh, PDF. In fact, it looks as though what it's doing, looking at this up here, looks as though it's trying to find the document and making sure it's in that particular directory. So this is SMB1, and you can see that uh, the file server is actually listening on port 445. So I've added, this is something I should also point out, I've added two additional columns, source port unresolved and destination port unresolved. I have that set in my uh, Wireshark configuration all the time actually, but uh, you should be aware that I, I think out of the box it, you don't get those two columns by default. What I'm going to do for safety's sake is I'm going to, oops, let's go back to there. I'm going to uh, follow that stream so that uh, I only have just that stream. So now we have the correct TCP stream. Now the next thing we need is some additional stuff. I will show you in the decode part. So SMB messages are identified by um, four pieces of information. There is, it, every SMB message will be associated with a tree ID. This is a share connection. So we have a tree ID. We have a process ID, and that literally is the process on the PC um, that issued the request that resulted in this um, this flow of traffic. We have a user ID, which is represents my test login on the test PC. And then we have this multiplex ID. The multiplex ID um, just gives a unique number for each request response pair. So we have a multiplex ID of 16577 for this trans2 request. And if we look at the trans2 response, we've got the same multiplex ID. If we look at the next pair, we've got a different multiplex ID for the for the request, but the response again matches the request. Those are the pieces of information we need. And now um, I'm fairly confident that everything um, on this TCP session would be just for my test user ID, but uh, we won't take a risk with that. We'll export that and use that information. Now the temptation here is to say, well, why don't I just right click on that and say, to select everything just with that user ID. The problem there is that if we look at some of the read data, such as this data here, this is actually this packet that I've highlighted here is the start of a read block. Wireshark puts the actual interpreted block at the end of the sequence of uh, packets that make up the whole block. So if you look down here, if we come down here, all the way down here, all of these packets relate to this final read here, which says, sorry, this is the data coming back. So this is the, as a result of the request, there's 16K of data and uh, this is the final packet. Now, if I put in a, a, a filter that says, just look for my user ID, I actually lose all of these packets and I'm going to use these later so I don't want to lose these packets so I can't use that as a filter but I'll deal with all of that once we get it into Excel. If I do need this information then what I can do is I can add it into the summary line. So if I right click on tree ID and I say apply as column you'll see that we now have tree ID in the summary line. We'll take the process as well, apply as a column, we'll take the user ID, apply as a column. And in fact, I don't actually need the multiplex ID for what I'm going to do, but I'm going to take it for cross-reference anyway, so we'll add that as well. So we've added four columns there. Now the other thing that I'm, because I'm only interested in process to process communication, I don't actually care about things like standalone act, TCP acts, such as this one just here. You can see zero length TCP value, standalone act. 
I'm not interested in those types of packets. So I'm going to filter those out simply by saying I want TCP length greater than zero. At that point, I'm good to go. So I'm ready to export. So let's export that data. I'm going to export it as a CSV. Um, I only want the packet summary line, although I think a CSV only gives you the packet summary line anyway, actually. But we'll choose that. I want those packets that are displayed, i.e. I, I want, the, want the packets after the filter. So I choose that. And in fact, I created one of these earlier, so I'm going to steal that name there. And uh, so that's my file. And now I do a save. And yes, I do want to replace the existing CSV. And that's it. So now we have the data. And before we move on, a couple of things I wanted to show you. This process ID stuff. You can see that we've got one process ID there of 1044. So let's have a look. This is the process monitor trace. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just choose a process ID of 1044. So what I'm doing here is uh, filtering uh, for Procmon events that are associated with process ID 1044. So we take that and we can see that actually that's all related to SVC host. Let's have a look at the next one. We've got a process ID of 4468. So let's try that one. So we want to untick that. Process ID of 4468. Apply that. Oops. That's Explorer, which is understandable. But Explorer would be uh, looking because we double clicked on the file in Explorer. Let's see if we can see any others. We've got one here. This is a bit of an anomaly. 65279. Um, these requests seem to be associated with pure system processes. And so they're not associated with a user process. And then in that case, they seem to get set to these values. So we'll have to ignore those ones. They will feature more later on. We've got another process ID here, 4752. Let's have a look at that one. Four seven five two. And that's Acrobat Reader. So you can see how you can match up these process IDs. So I think that's enough for now and um Next, in the next episode, we'll look at processing the data with Excel.